Hola, buenas tardes. As you can tell, my Spanish is very good, but if you're wondering why I was just reaching for an imaginary object that wasn't there, it's because I'm mimicking what I'm assuming is a fairly common experience for some of the shorter ones of us in the audience. Raise your hand if you've ever had a hard time reaching for a cup or a plate in a cupboard or reaching for something before. I'm seeing some raised hands. Probably, as any of you who are the parents of young children know, uh, you may have had to help your kids reach something that was a little difficult to reach in the kitchen. Um, and the reason that I think this happens is because most of the people who make those cabinets, who make those cupboards for our kitchens, don't really think about kids when they're making those things. Now imagine a world designed with kids in mind. Don't you think it would be a better world? Imagine some of those cupboard and cabinet makers thought, huh, a child might want something in here. Or if Ciudad de las Ideas decided that maybe we would just have a little midday nap, a siesta, because listening to smart people talk is really exhausting. <laughs> Although extraordinarily interesting, but I really think a nap should be scheduled. It would be a wonderful contribution. Or on a more serious note, if every time governments cut education budgets, then they thought of the kids in the classrooms and their futures. Or when countries get into wars and criminals uh, shoot their guns, are they thinking of us? The reason that I'm asking all of these questions, as I'm sure you know the answers to, is because, from what I can see, we live in a world that is very much not designed with kids in mind. Being 13, I should know. Even though politicians and our governments often claim to be thinking of the next generation, young kids, our children, uh, then in many ways, the world that we live in really isn't designed with us in mind. Too often, our societies are very adult-centric. On the visible level, we have way too many of those hard-to-reach places, but on the more invisible level, or on the um, harder-to-see level, then the way that youth are treated around the world every day isn't in our interests, and it isn't in your interests either. Today, I'm here to make the case as to why we need to design our world with kids in mind. Because it doesn't just help us, it helps our kids, and their kids, and you. To me, one of the most personal ways in which I see a world not designed with kids in mind is the way in which kids are often treated by adults. So just think of a recent lunch with a friend or maybe a business partner. Now imagine that in every one of those situations, your friend or business partner was the only one talking, and in a kind of condescending voice, too. And no, I'm not talking about the way imperial powers have dealt with their colonies, at least not specifically, or the way the United States still deals with some developing countries. Again, at least not specifically. Instead, I'm addressing the average adult-child relationship. You know what I mean, sending the kids off to another room while the adults talk about literature, or current events, or even mutual gossip, because think of poor little children exposed to high culture. I hope this kind of scenario won't apply to many of you in the room today, but some of us may have seen such scenarios played out in our own living rooms. My parents and my family uh, provide a good example. My sister Adriana, she often complains that nobody hears her, and whether it's because her voice is too quiet or what it is, it, the sad thing is oftentimes it's true. Sometimes she'll say something, only to have my mom point out the very same thing a couple minutes later, and she's like, nobody hears me, um, and that's too bad. And it's not because my parents are bad parents or because my family is really deaf, it's because sometimes we just don't know how to listen. And this is oftentimes done unconsciously. I mentioned earlier that there are visible ways and invisible ways in which the world isn't designed with kids in mind. One of the things I would put in the invisible category is, coincidentally, making kids invisible. Oops, where is that picture? Oh, maybe it's not in there. Oh, well. Uh, not having us at the table being part of decisions or listening to our ideas. And just as a condescending, I don't want to listen to you attitude hasn't ultimately worked well for imperial powers, I made this nice little collage. The flags on the bottom are all flags that um, basically kicked their colonizers' butts, saying it colloquially. I think just as ultimately this hasn't worked well for imperial powers, it doesn't work well when it comes to the relationship between adults and kids. But you might say, well, what's the big deal about listening in the first place? Kids will grow, and then they become adults, and then they will have their say. However, as we age, we become more influenced by our peers, by our societies. We may be more used to conformity and thinking inside the box, leading to less inspired and innovative ideas. 
Ultimately, when adults don't embrace what they can learn from kids, send us out of the room, don't bother asking our opinion, they're closing their eyes to potentially bright and exciting ideas. Sharing ideas shouldn't be something that comes like a ride in Disneyland <laughs> waiting in a very long line. It should be available no matter what your age. A lot of people hear me and they, oops, and they think, well, is she saying that adults are really dumb and they don't have any good ideas? No. Obviously, I have learned a lot from speaking with adults like the ones here at this conference. And uh, I've learned a lot of the issue from being included in your conversations, which is why you shouldn't send us out of the room. And when you think about it, the best relationships are reciprocal. When was the last good friendship you had with someone who never wanted to know what you thought? It's easier to return the feeling of respect when someone else listens to you and respects you. For instance, uh, when I feel respected, I'm more likely to return the feeling. Every one of you in the room today can think, instead of always demanding you listen to me, maybe it's time you started thinking about what you can learn from listening to us. After all, we have a lot to teach. My peers can show you a level of fearlessness, creativity, and empathy that many adults can only envy. Without saying about old dogs and new tricks, I heard a study saying that it might be false, which means that you too can have those qualities if you don't already. We probably all watched TV shows with brave heroes and thought, oops, another slide is missing. Oh, we probably all watched TV shows with brave heroes like Superman and thought, oh, why can't I be like them? Why can't I have superpowers? Well, maybe aside from the superpowers, we can be with enough courage. In particular, I think that the courage it takes out to set on ventures when you can't be sure of the outcome is courage that we don't see often enough. Just think of a time you had a really good idea, but then you said, well, I don't know if that's possible. There's really no way that'll happen. Over time, we get used to hearing those words, and we start to believe them. Obviously, no one bothered to tell there's no way that'll happen to William Kamkwamba, or if they did, he was still strong enough to believe in his ideas. So to tell you the story of William Kamkwamba, here's a riddle. What can you make out of blue gum trees, an old bicycle, and scrap metal? Well, if you're William Kamkwamba, then blue gum trees, a bike, and scrap metal equals a wind turbine. Yes, a wind turbine to produce electricity. He was a uh, then 14-year-old Malawian who, after having to leave school because his family could no longer pay tuition, went to the library and read voraciously about electricity. And then he decided to build his own wind turbine. And it actually, this was a wind turbine that worked. It brought electricity to his village. While you, we might call making a wind turbine out of scrap materials rather irrational, we might say, in fact, there's no way that'll happen. It's important to realize that beginnings, irrational or not, can lead to great things. When you think about it, it's really the problems that are unacceptable. Uh, you know, some would argue that irrational thinking has gotten us into those problems in the first place, but I would argue that we need to fight fire with fire. Desperate times call for desperate thinking. Sure, thinking that a wind turbine could bring power to a village in Africa is pretty irrational, but a village without electricity is unacceptable. Kids like William Kamkwamba, their unrestrained thinking gives us the power to innovate, to create. Uh, and we've heard a lot here at this conference about the importance of doing those things. I believe that innovation, creativity, and sometimes maybe irrationality can provide the fuel for the engine of progress. A world designed with kids in mind gives youth the opportunity to share their creativity. We can be brimming with interesting, creative ideas. We just need an outlet. For my sister, it might be music. You'll hear her play after, uh, afterwards. And for me, my outlet was writing. For others, it might be science or skateboarding, art or whatever it is. Um, and creativity is directly tied in with resourcefulness. What can you make out of the things that you have? Maybe you don't think this is so very important for kids to do right now, but I would ask this, what kind of employee would you rather have? Number one, resourceful, who can make the most out of any situation or material. Or two, who can only do what they're ordered to do from step-by-step -step instructions. I don't know what your opinion is on this, but I know that from all the um, lovely volunteers I've seen here, La Ciudad de las Ideas are all number ones. It seems too often, though, as though we're raising kids to become number two. And we have robots for that. You know, if we're advancing this much in science, surely we can also advance in kids' creativity. We heard from Sir Ken Robinson about the importance of this. Indeed, to me, a world designed with kids in mind is one in which we have ample room for creativity. A 
child's world today, and some of you who have children may know this, is saturated with passive activities. We're sitting in front of the TV screen, uh, and, and you know, that's fine in moderation. I watched TV when I was little too. I'm not saying stop TV, but it's not good when the only fun you have is watching TV. I have a baby cousin, and my sister and I, we often contrast our grow up, growing up to hers. So she has organic clothes, and lots of jumperoos, and tons of toys. I mean, we had a fair amount of toys, but we weren't really wearing organic clothes. Um, but I don't necessarily envy all that. Because my sister and I were very privileged to grow up uh, when we had a few very essential toys. We had styrofoam, and we had dirt, and we had envelopes that can be recycled really environmentally friendly into crowns instead of buying new ones. Just thought I would mention. With these rather unconventional toys, we'd put together architecture on our living room carpet. We'd become mummies, or we would use leaves outside as our currency in a world of a marketplace of mud sculptures. We would create these game scenario scenes, and it was fun. Without knowing it, while we were making these mud sculptures, my sister and I, we were probably utilizing our creativity to an extent that would help us in later life. Our parents didn't restrict us, didn't tell us that we couldn't drag the uh, blanket out of our room into the living room to make our fort. What a world designed with kids in mind seems obvious. Adults would listen and learn from kids and try not to put in place too many meaningless restrictions. Too often, though, if you're not one of the Adoras or Adrianas out there, then the adult response to all this fearlessness and creativity is, be quiet, go away, shut up. And that's what's preventing adults from learning from kids. I mean, just try to have a conversation with someone who puts their metaphorical mouth, uh, hand over your mouth and asks you a question. That's very, very difficult. Maybe the question isn't even being asked in the first place. So that would be a metaphor. But unfortunately, I see that happening too often as reality. There are some wonderful examples here at La Ciudad de las Ideas of adults who either as kids had more opportunities. I was talking with Tara Bus, you saw her dad speak the other day, and she was telling me about how she went campaigning with her mom politically uh, at the age of seven, which I thought was awesome. And then uh, we were talking uh, with Mr. and Mrs. Markram, you know, the imaginary myth of the brain, and they are interested in starting um, a website that has scientific papers for students to peer review. So these are just a few examples of wonderful people who are getting kids involved. And I want them to not become the exception, but rather the norm. Yet too many adults don't bother to include kids, even on some of the issues that might affect us directly, like, for instance, education. We're the ones who go into the classroom and sit in the classroom chairs and listen to the lesson. So I believe, oops, this is way ahead. Oops, that's weird. Um, I think that we should really have a say in how our schools are run. Maybe one of the reasons that students complain that school is boring is because we're not involved enough. And when I go to an education conference, they often have to get someone to escort me in because their insurance doesn't cover kids. They don't expect students to be in an education conference. Such roadblocks when it comes to trusting kids and giving us responsibility are roadblocks when it comes to learning from us, too. Why this prevalently restrictive attitude? Our bodies are growing. Why wouldn't our dreams? Yet when the average kid says that they want to do more than sleep, study, socialize, maybe start their own business or publish a book, most adults might say something like, oh, wait until you're older, that's a good idea, you can do that when you grow up. You might have noticed it's always what you want to do when you grow up, not what are you planning on doing right now. Ultimately, some of our greatest ideas came from youth who didn't defer their dreams for the sake of an average childhood, and whose parents didn't defer them either. I've talked about how a world designed with kids in mind can benefit kids and adults who know them, but um, maybe when you think of a world designed with kids in mind, you think of this really frightening, nightmarish image of like a nursery and toys all over and bright colors, and that's really not what a world designed with kids in mind has to look like. A world designed with kids in mind is one which benefits adults too. It's far more general and inclusive. It's a commonly accepted fact that war isn't good for kids. Well, it's not good for anyone except maybe uh, military contractors who are making giant profits. Um, and on a local level, violence in our communities can have a huge impact on what life is like growing up. We face this in the US, and some of our cities, like Chicago, have huge levels of violence. Um, here in Mexico, I read an article on azcentral.com which said that schools across Mexico are teaching students to dive to the floor and cover their heads as urban gunfights multiply. At least nine shootouts have erupted in school zones since mid-October from last year. On June 15th, soldiers and gunmen battled for an hour just 60 feet from a preschool. You know, that's the kind of thing that is obviously not a world designed with kids in mind. The fact that a conflict erupted right near a preschool, I think that really speaks for it. A world with design with kids in mind would be one without this violent conflict. I know we heard from Steven Pinker that violence is going down, but it needs to go down even more. 
Isn't that something that adults like you could enjoy as well? I mentioned earlier how many people in government claim to be thinking about kids, whether about personal safety or education, but one of the issues which some politicians seem to overlook is the importance of preserving our natural environment. We kids have a vested interest in it because we're going to be living here for the rest of our lives. But with the planet in the shape that it's in right now, who knows what it'll look like over the rest of our lives. And if no one does anything right now, we're the ones who will be living in a world without glaciers. Indeed, though we too are affected by all kinds of different uh, types of change, environmental, economical, educational, our voices are not heard as often as those of adults. We need leadership from the young generation, from kids like me, and from many of the young people here in the audience. I already see a lot of this leadership here in my peers. This is Alec Lors, founder of Kids vs. Global Warming, and uh, he does a lot of work to spearhead change in the environmental area. He became the youngest licensee for Al Gore's climate change presentation. He persisted and persisted even after they told him he was too young. Uh, maybe some of you recall the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. You might have seen pictures of oiled birds. And Olivia Bowler was an 11-year-old who actually offered her drawings to uh, those who donated money to help clean up the birds. So these are examples of kids who are taking action, doing great things, and it really shows that you don't have to wait until you're older. BP put out, um, I think, close to $100 million, according to CNN money, on advertising. And when you see people like Olivia who are donating, who are really trying to make change, you know, it's a sharp contrast. One thing that many criticize these top BP officials for, notably Tony Hayward, who said he won his life back, was a lack of empathy. One thing that you can learn from kids is that truly it shouldn't be about making money. It should be about the impact your organization has on the world. Is it positive? Is it negative? Aside from corporate responsibility when it comes to ethics and the environment, what can large companies and corporations do to show that they have kids in mind? In too many cases, corporations have us in mind for the wrong reasons. Raise your hand if you've heard of McDonald's. I am assuming that most people uh, have heard of McDonald's. Oops. Again, I'm missing a slide. Oh, well. Um, so maybe you've also heard of the McDonald's Happy Meal. So it's this kid-sized version of the burger. And uh, long story short, these are burgers which contain high levels of sodium, fat, you know, unhealthy stuff. So why do kids keep on buying? Because it comes with a toy, and that makes it attractive to kids. And um, obviously, McDonald's was thinking of kids, designing this with kids in mind, well, thinking of our psychology and their profits anyway, but maybe not so much our health. So are there any adults who are designing a world with kids in mind the right way? There are examples, both in the United States and in Latin America, of adults who are doing their part to make the world a better place for kids. We were walking near Chapultepec Castle uh, last week when we were doing sightseeing, and actually a group ran up behind me, and they were like, Adora, Adora, and they recognized me from my TED speech, which was really awesome. Um, and we started talking, and we found out that they actually run a group called, uh, called El Pozo de Vida, uh, which is fighting human trafficking, particularly the sexual exploitation of kids. And your opportunities are obviously limited if you're enslaved and under threat. And your opportunities are limited too when you have no or very little access to education. We talked to a Chilean who told us that uh, his country provides free education for those who are going to teaching. Uh, here in Mexico, I read the governor of Tamaulip, I have no idea how to pronounce the state, T-A-M-A-U-L-I-P-A-S. Um, someone needs to teach me. But Eugenio Hernandez is investing 13 million pesos in education. Uh, here on TV, actually um, in the US, we found out about Gustavo Dudamel, whose El Sistema program is uh, giving young people the chance to learn an instrument. And even more locally, I was really thrilled to see that Grupo Salinas, um, the, one of the major sponsors of this conference, supports the Esperanza Azteca Orchestra, who we heard. And that's what it gives kids. Esperanza, I believe, means hope. And that's what it gives kids, hope and opportunity. A world designed with kids in mind means opportunity and creativity, and that's basically what these musical programs offer. But is a world designed with kids in mind just opportunity and creativity? No. A world designed with kids in mind means personal safety and quality of education. It's one with glaciers and greenness, clean water and air. It's one in which companies and corporations behave responsibly, thinking about our shared future. Earlier, I compared the attitudes of world powers toward developing countries as a metaphor for how kids are often treated by adults. Just as I foresee a day when all nations will work as equal partners, I foresee a world where adults will learn to listen and learn from kids, especially from those they feel may be less developed than them. Kids. 
This vision may not come today, but with our joined efforts, maybe it can come tomorrow. I'm not going to take wait until you're older as an answer. When today's leaders, adults like you, join with today, tomorrow's leaders, kids like me, then we can have the power to make such a vision a reality. I urge you to begin designing the origins of the future with kids and with kids in mind, because after all, the origins of the future start with us. Thank you.